It's member-supported Hawaii Public Radio and all things considered. We are in our Atherton Performing Arts Studio. I'm Dave Lawrence, and uh, a real pleasure today. We have a multiple Emmy Award winner, author, actor, stand-up comedian, producer. This guy's done a lot. One of Comedy Central's 100 Greatest Stand-Up Comedians of All Time. Big part of the FX comedy series Baskets. Stars in films like Coming to America, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He's had a lot of TV experience. Some of it would include... Being the host of Family Feud, creator of Life with Louie on Fox, just to name a few. He is through Saturday at the Blue Note. We're really lucky that he's here in our Atherton Performing Arts Studio with us. It's Louie Anderson on All Things Considered. Welcome. Hey, thank you. It's great to have you here. Great and to be here. Is this, what's your experience with Hawaii like? Uh, I think I came here to the Royal Hawaiian in the late 80s. Or mid '80s, I'm not quite sure. To the Comedy Store, okay. They had a, a Comedy Store uh, Hawaii for a while at the Royal Hawaiian, the big pink hotel on the beach. Is that Paulie's mom who has that? Paulie's mom, and um, not only that, I think I was with uh, Jim Carrey and Sam Kennison and uh, Roseanne Barr and people like that. You know, it was five. I think there were three to five comics, and it was fifteen bucks. Wow. The deals that? that they used to have on stuff, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think it was to get people in, you know, and right. to do it. it was Introduce it. It was fun. It was really fun. It was great experience coming to Hawaii. I, you know, the beauty of Hawaii is you're going to relax whether you want to or not. Right. Yeah, it's kind of overpowering. That's a great way of putting it. You can't, you can't fight it when you get yeah. on the plane. And Something if you are happen. fighting it, you're really the only one doing that. Right. And you've come to the wrong place. Yeah, you have. <laughs> you wasted a lot of money. You'll be really frustrated. <laughs> um, you mentioned some, uh, some funny folks that, that have been part of your, your very colorful life. I couldn't help but look at some of your social media in advance of this. And forgive me, but I was looking and I saw pictures of at least Conan O'Brien. It seemed to suggest that possibly he'd be here at the same time. Or is that just the way I was reading it? Uh, I think that was just to get your attention that I was going to be here. (laughs) I just did the show with him, with him. And And so I use that picture because I love him so much. And um, I said, I think I did it with some other people, too. Kevin Nealon and it? Fluffy and Kevin Nealon and Wesley Snipes. I just happened to get all those pictures in one okay. week. And I said, I'm going to use these because, you know, you can never find a good picture of just you. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> at least I can. I'm the, very, you know, I'm picky about that. I get that way, too. That's funny you say that. The Temps also in there, I see. Yes. <laughs> and then I ran into them at the airport. I've opened for them. So that was a really joy wow. to see him at the airport. You know, <laughs> I opened for almost every single act. In Las Vegas in the 80s and 90s. So a lot of those music hybrids you were part of? Yeah, you know, I I opened for Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers and Ray Charles and Glenn Campbell and uh, and, um, uh, Natalie Cole and uh, the Pointer Sisters and um, Smokey Robinson, um, Ray Charles. I mean, I just opened for everybody because I had a clean act. Right. So uh, I was a flavor of the flavor of that time and i had an agent who booked a lot of those people so i got to open for him it was a great to meet them all that's advantageous having the kind of work that can put you into the that uh any good memories of of glenn that uh we had glenn on the show too and you know i absolutely adored glenn campbell and i don't think people knew i think sometimes people write off people who are in country uh music but this guy had an unbelievable voice but not only that he played, he, was, that thing, man. he played that guitar like a rock star. Yep. I mean, he could really play that guitar. And he's a real nice guy, too. When you Very were, sweet. So your interactions were cool. You were opening yeah. and he was singing. Actually, he, he went on to begin the show. Right. And then I went on in the middle while they changed the set wow. for Ray Charles. Because Ray Charles had a country album at one time. So they were double billing. Basically. So they double billed those guys at Bally's and I got to be the middle act. I think I got seven minutes or 10 minutes, at, but I just sat every night on the side of the stage in backstage. And that was the best part. <laughs> yeah. And you know, Ray Charles cried every performance at some point when he was singing, just tears were draping down different songs or mostly, uh, um, I think it was, I want to say it was Georgia. But I, I also want to say it was some other song. But, you know, he just was so overwhelmed by what he was doing. He was so connected to it. He, his tears just flowed out. 
It must be uh, a lot of challenges when you think about doing gigs like that, where you've got to go on between these legendary you know, bookends of, of entertainment and really different ones too. And you've got to do your bit and make it work in a short amount of time. And I think of this role of Christine on baskets. I mean, talk about something that is a challenge. I love the quote you said about it. You said, quote, it felt like it was divine intervention when I got the call to be on the show that somehow my mom from the great beyond was finally getting herself into show business where she truly belonged in the first place. Explain. I agree. Uh, I think that my mom, uh, I always thought she was a person of, she, you know, when she walked in a room, people noticed her and she commanded. She had a lot of charisma. She had 11 children and she put up with my dad, who was an extremely abusive alcoholic. But she never, ever let us feel the brunt of that in a sense. You know, she always had a smile. She always got up every morning and made us breakfast our whole lives. Uh-huh. And I can still smell the oatmeal, the eggs, the toast, and bacon. And um, I, and I just think that she, I always thought to myself, this is, this is a woman who really could have been in show business or anything. Uh, could have been a politician or, a, or could have been a, 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 led a company. But she led our family. And so I feel like I'm responsible for uh, holding up that. And then to get a chance to play her is such a great homage. You know, I just loved her. And so now... Uh, in 2018, I'm going to play her again for the third season. And she would have been 106. She was born in 1912. And so, you know, this is just like a dream come true. Right. I think I'm just a, a vehicle for this. I actually do a vessel and uh, I try to honor it. I try to make Louis Anderson the person disappear in there. That is a, uh, and it's got to be, I mean, it's a visual challenge too because they have to really do you up to make that happen (laughs) you know and and you know people think it's my hair often (laughs) which is really funny right i go yeah sure i just agree with them (laughs) i never argue with people hey aren't you that one guy go i sure am (laughs) you know because people just say you know um those kind of things and why dispel if it makes them happy right because that's the idea yeah because you know people really don't want to hear your opinion they just want you to confirm that they're right don't you think i mean is that i mean the goal of what you're doing what feels because it's so different everyone you're you're playing music you're a broadcaster you're a painter you want to you get a good feeling when you see them laugh it's just is that really the idea is it more like you feel like your craft is developing or or? both but mostly i feel like i have released i've relieved their pain uh there's it's a form of therapy yeah well i mean i think i think i make people forget their troubles for an hour and a half I think, or an hour, or whatever. I'm up there. Is it harder with all the dark stuff happening? Like, does it, or does it? What's your What's your perspective? If you were to put your pulse on things, does it seem like things are kind of going off the rails, or is, is that just my imagination? You know, I just think it's secular, and I think this is the same feeling I had in the '60s, and the early '70s. You know, Russia was a problem then in the '60s. Um, you know, we had riots in the streets. Um, we had trouble in politics. All those things were going on when I was growing up. And I think it's a louder now because we have more forms of communication for it. people. We hear, yeah, where everything's a lot uh, more audible because, you know, we, we never got our stuff. You know, the, we either got an interrupted uh, with Walter Cronkite for a CBS report or we had the 630 evening news. But, you know, in the newspaper, those were the things. Uh, but, there were lots of protests and riots and, you know, all kinds of things going on in the 60s and 70s. And then people tend to, like, think that it's more going on now. Right. Um, I still find that uh, and I'm hopeful that this is a better place and pe- m- there are more people trying to make it better than there are people trying to make it worse. Well, it's a great parallel, something you point out. During a lot of dark times, some incredible art was made, a lot of great comedy, movies, music. You think of the period you're talking about during Vietnam, there were just so many bands almost as a reaction to it. Um, But then I think about how that relates to your your development. Henny Youngman plays a critical role. We're talking about classic folks. It's 1981, a comedy competition. Explain how this dude runs into your life in such a big way. Well, he was one of the judges. There were three judges. And uh, he bonded with me or thought I was great. And uh, I just saw the tape of that. My friend who ran that festival is still, 
you know, in comedy. And he sent me the tape of my performance. And boy, I just have changed so much. There were so many things that were, you know, I was more of a one line comic back then. And uh, I still love a great joke. But um, I think what happened was that he said, you know, I came in third out of uh, three people. They always say in my publicity that I won it, but I, I always say, I quit fighting with them. <laughs> but I, I came in third. There was a guy who did song parodies, came in first, and a guy who juggled fire came in second. And when I accepted the speech, I said, I'm just glad there wasn't an accordion player who told jokes. <laughs> and Henny thought that was good. And then I started writing for his grandson and him. His grandson was a big guy like me, so I wrote jokes for him and wrote for Henny. Wow. And uh, we, we stayed friends up until his death. That's powerful. Um, and uh, and I, I could keep you for a long time, but there's another, before I let you go, there's a great thing that you, a lot of comedians, kind of like that, it's a good parallel. You are taking this comedic thing into new generations and new paths. There were a lot of people that came before you. And like Henny, there's another cat who played a pivotal role. Your first late night TV was Carson. Yeah. I mean, and you think Carson, when I was a kid, that was, you know, my mom and dad every night when I said goodnight to them, they'd be watching that on TV. And there you are, 1984. Had to be, you know, exciting at the time. So exciting. First of all, I grew up as a poor kid in St. Paul. So I would watch The Tonight Show with my dad, who was a jazz musician with Hoagie Carmichael. And um, so he would let me stay up and watch the comedians. And because he loved Doc Severinsen, uh, mm. who was a trumpet player. My right. dad was a trumpet and cornet player. And so it was full circle for me, you know. Here I am, this kid in the projects of St. Paul, watching The Tonight Show, watching these comedians. In 1984, I'm backstage and I hear Johnny Carson say, here's a young guy from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, making his television debut. And here I am now in Hawaii, and I'm at the Blue Note, a jazz club, right. that I don't know if my dad played at, because you know I think the Blue Note's been around for a long, a long time. time. And my dad recently got an album my dad was playing with uh, Satchmo, and he was, you know, he was a great trumpet player. So I feel like a full circle here too. And I tell you, that Blue Note is one beautiful club. Anything you want to reveal about what's in store, where you draw things from for what's going to be on stage? Tonight, I'm going to do all my new material, and I'm going to do all my mom, dad, sister, brother stuff also. So I always do a whole chunk of stuff about my family. But tonight, I'm working on a new special, so I'm going to do all the material, see how it floats in Hawaii. It's going to be at the Blue Note, and he is through Saturday. It's Louis Anderson here on member-supported Hawaii Public Radio, all things considered in our Atherton Performing Arts Studio. Hope you had fun. I enjoyed this. I had a great time. Thank you. Thank you.